Hello, everybody. My name is Gurvinder Alawalia, and you entered the panel discussion on the topic AI may outgrow our capacity to judge it. Uh, welcome, and thank you for taking the time, either in the live event or if you're watching um, uh, a replay uh, following the event. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel that is assembled over here. Before I, before I turn my attention into the panel, I would like to introduce the topic. So when we talk about AI may outgrow our capacity to judge it, we are looking at AI, whether AI reflects the beliefs and the biases of those who structure it and who may be incapable of judging it. In the context of India, given the strengths that India has as far as IT is concerned, as far as exports is concerned, the question that arises for this conference is, will that bias from those who are structuring technology and AI from India permeate into the global ecosystem of AI platforms, or will it be checked and controlled uh, and managed either through local controls in India or otherwise through customers, uh, managers in other parts of the world outside of India? So the idea is not necessarily to be too alarmist, uh, because sometimes it's also considered that AI is, you know, just a fairly set of benign computer coded algorithms. Why do we have to worry about this? Is it necessary to exert control and oversight over a machine? Are machines now entering into the realm which borders the human intelligence? And therefore, we need similar controls on machines, just we have, just as we have frameworks and policies in governing our societal behavior and dynamics. So, to discuss that topic and to share their deep ex experiences, we have um, we have four experts. We have five experts uh, assembled over here. Um, let me have. David Bremer, who is the Chief Strategy Officer for Nextroid, uh, introduce uh, introduce himself. David, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, so Nextroid is a U.S. company uh, based in Boston that is uh, <clears throat> using AI to rethink how we do insurance and how we verify and validate automotive driving. It's becoming especially important as an increasing number of ADAS capabilities are are brought into the limelight in, in new cars. Because, uh, quite frankly, it's very difficult to tell whether they're helping or hurting in some cases. And understanding the impact is, is very important. So it's an interesting application of AI to, um, you know, really take what we've done in self-driving, but actually apply it to, to, to what I would call safety in a more generic sense. Um, but the implications for, for ethics and AI is really important. For instance, you know, we have the ability to actually now measure the impact of your driving on the rest of the roadway. So the question is, what do we do with that? Um, but I come to you with a background of about 23 years uh, of doing self-driving and robotics um, and really excited to be part of this panel. Welcome, David. And, uh, you know, just to embellish a little bit more of David's background, which I neglected to do previously, David tells me that his goal is to create robots and transportation solutions that change the way we live. Um, the change the way we live, change the way we move and understand ourselves and get important things done. And as he was talking about it, uh, you can guess some of his areas of expertise are autonomous driving, unmanned ground and air vehicles and autonomous robotic behavior. Uh, David joins us from Santa, Santa Barbara, though I think he's in some national park right now uh, having a lot of fun. Welcome, David. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our next panelist is uh, Jay Daruwala. He's the founder and chief executive officer of Yaktrack Online. Yaktrack.com specializes in speech recognition for contact center applications. And Jay specializes in technology commercialization and product development. He sold, this is interesting, particularly for this conference and this audience. Jay sold the first ever Ethernet switch in India. That really tickled me. I mean, I, I think that, is, that must have been such a proud moment. And then particularly looking back at 
where internet and where India is today. Jo, uh, Jay joins us from British Columbia, uh, Canada. Jay, would you like to share uh, um, any opening remarks? Sure. Thanks, Govinder. Uh, yeah. So, 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 guys, uh, I am uh, running this this business uh, called Yak Check. We are doing uh, you know speech recognition for contact centers. It typically amounts to you know various things like uh, sales productivity, uh, you know, voice of the customer analysis, evaluating uh, contact center agents. Uh, and uh, more recently, I've actually gotten through another company, gotten involved in in some exciting uh, other kind of AI work, where uh, we're looking at computer vision based uh, applications of satellite uh, remote sensing data. So yeah, that's what I'm up to in AI. Uh, thanks. Well, thank you, Jay. Thank you, and welcome to the panel. It's so excited to you know have a really good crowd over here, uh, and I can see the audience is um, is uh, is swelling up. And uh, to the audience, I will say. Um, you know, just uh, put your questions um, uh, in the gallery, in the chat gallery. Uh, I think there's also a grab the microphone kind of a feature. We'll come to that. Uh, definitely we'll come to that in the end. But I'm actually happy and I would encourage weaving in questions as we go, go along. This not a very rigid structure over here, but we do have uh, certain themes organized, which I'll come to in just a moment. Uh, our next panelist is Junaid Islam. Junaid is a partner at UDA. And uh, he has over 30 years of experience in secure communications. When I first spoke to Jay, he just blew me out of my out of my mind on some of the weaponry work and cybersecurity work that he's done. Jay has supported the development of many protocols. For those of you who come from the internet working kind of um, uh, networking world, uh, he's worked on MPLS and mobile IPv6, um, and then onward to zero trust. Uh, architectures, excuse me, architectures. Um, Junaid is currently a partner at UDA, which designs secure enterprise architecture for Fortune 500 companies, and he joins us for, from San Francisco. Uh, Junaid, your opening remarks. Great. Well, well, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I've, uh, as mentioned, I've been involved in secure comms uh, 30 years. What I've been doing most recently is working on smart cities and smart transportations uh, across America or different states. I'm helping the state of Indiana with their uh, digital agriculture, smart transportation, uh, working in Hawaii, have contracts in Puerto Rico. And in all these projects, we have machine learning uh, uh, because these systems are so complex. So, you know, my concern, especially having come from a national security background, is are these systems uh, secure or fragile? And, you know, one of the things uh, we, that's a big issue in machine learning is as they take over these systems and the machine learning systems are so new, are we really sure they're safe? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, when they collect all this data, the data lake, are we sure the data is not going to be exfiltrated, right? So I see a lot of potential in machine learning, but I think we have a long, long way to go and we should be very careful before we actually let them control cities that we live in. Uh, I look forward to the panel. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, so much uh, wealth of experience to share over here. Uh, Janet, thank you so much and welcome to the panel. Our next panelist is um, uh, William Palaya. William, am I saying that correctly? Correctly, thank you. Uh, and I would, I would think uh, he goes by Will, which he does. And William is the founder of, uh, I'll just call it together, even though it's spelled in a millennial texting kind of a style. Well, you know, it's hard and, to get to the day. name. <laughs> absolutely. So together is a startup to aggregate services via mobile for the homeless. Um, yes. There could be other, other areas. I'll just give it to William in just a moment. In this role, Will has also handled government-private partnerships in AI, and we'll we'll tap upon some of that experience because that is really important, not just in India, but anywhere on how policies are being formed, the collaboration between government and and, and private sector. William joins us from uh, Minneapolis. Uh, William, your, you know, one minute, uh, one and a half minute of opening remarks, and then we'll go to Ed. All right, great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate, uh, you know, being here and with all of you. It's such an honor. Um, my name is Will Palaya. Uh, you know, I am a founder of Startup uh, of Together and uh, a couple other companies, but I also have a consultancy um, where I deal, you know, with uh, government private partnerships um, and is also, you know, in Minneapolis. Um, 
But in dealing with AI specifically, uh, we have three really use cases or areas that we focus on. I mean, one is predictive analytics for transportation and infrastructure. Two, as you had mentioned, homelessness, humanitarian aid, you know, dealing with demographics, aggregating resources, et cetera. Um, and then modeling uh, government services, delivery strategies, and their automation. Um, in doing that, that also pulled me into what is known as collective intelligence, or CI. A lot of people think of that as kind of the wisdom of the crowd that's been thrown around. Um, the nice thing about it is that you do get improved insights. You do get that accumulated expertise with a human touch. Um, but, you know, like everything, you know, it, you really need to define, you know, who that crowd is. And uh, that's kind of where we've had issues. Um, you know, I'll be mentioning uh, one of my clients who is a native of uh, Hyderabad, uh, who I have a partnership with, and we can discuss that further. Uh, I'll throw it back. Thank you. Thank you so much, William. Uh, welcome to the panel. So glad to have you. Last but not the least, our um, fifth <laughs> panelist is Ed Sewell. Ed, thanks for joining. I hope you didn't have too much trouble uh, getting into the link, uh, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> founder and Chief Executive Officer of Velocity AI. Velocity AI is an ESG data and sustainability company addressing financial inclusion. Um, uh, uh, I'll let you elaborate a little bit more on that. Will has also worked in the AeroCity India project, and Will is, I'm sorry, um, uh, Ed yeah. has also worked in the, in the, in the, on the AeroCity India project. And Ed, uh, sorry about that uh, snafu, Ed joins us from Atlanta. Ed, no. your minute, minute and a half of opening remarks, please. Thank you, Govinda. No, no problem. <clears throat> we have so many pa um, great pan panel members. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to join. So again, CEO and founder of Velocity AI. We focus on EST data, uh, primarily around uh, identifying investment opportunities for institutional investors and then matching up with uh, either companies uh, that they want to invest in directly uh, as far as startups in the AI space and or uh, projects. So a lot of large projects. You talked about the Arrow City in uh, India. Uh, we're doing work out of London with the Emerging Alliance and uh, a number of the things that we're working with that are part of the Emerging Alliance. And then at our headquarters in Atlanta, uh, it's a program called Smart Atlanta that was sponsored by the city of Atlanta, the state of Georgia, and the federal government. And that's um, creating a smart city uh, to help in a number of different areas, um, primarily around connectivity as it relates to broadband infrastructure. So we help uh, we help drive investment uh, for AI and for broadband uh, internet connectivity in underserved communities. Uh, and also when we talk about financial inclusion, um, part of that is collecting the right types of data to identify um, people in communities that are best in need and the best suit for connecting them to the digital economy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, um, not just sustainable initiatives over there, but also very, very important societally. Um, thank you for joining the panel. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to now take a minute to introduce uh, myself. Uh, by now, everyone can uh, guess I'm moderating uh, the panel. My name is Gurvinder Alawalia. I'm the founder and chief uh, executive officer for Digital Twin Labs based in Dallas. Um, Digital Twin Labs develops platforms and products for companies based on blockchain, based on crypto tokens, and then other pillars of frontier technology like IoT and cloud and increasingly AI and machine learning. I was previously the chief technology officer for IBM's blockchain, IoT, and cloud business covering North America and also had the honor of being a member of the IBM Academy of Technology. Um, I formed Digital Twin Labs uh, about uh, four or five years ago. We've done implementation for the global trade of uh, diamonds, um, uh, supply chain platforms based on, um, uh, based on blockchain, uh, putting together with collaboration with another company, also represented at the conference over here called ninthgear.com, ninthgear.com uh, for foreign currency exchange uh, platform uh, based on block on blockchain. I'm, as I said, I'm based in Dallas, even though right now I'm joining you from Los Angeles um, uh, during some travels. 
So um, thank you once again, everybody here in the panel. And thank you uh, also the audience that has taken the time to join from um, a diversity of time zones, I'm guessing. And I would encourage questions into the, into the gallery or otherwise through the microphone uh, whenever you'd like um, uh, to, to, uh, to come in from the audience side. So uh, we've organized, I've organized the three themes uh, for the rest of the discussion over here. Um, uh, and those three themes are, one is around judgment and discretion, right? Which is a little bit to my opening comments in introducing the topic, judgment and discretion. The other is around oversight and policy. And then we want to close with some specifics pertaining to India, some takeaways from the rich experience we have over here, specific to the India uh, environment, knowing um, the strength of technology uh, that comes from India, that is built in India, and then goes out to the entire world. So here's, um, I'm going to go in the order um, in which uh, the panelists were introduced. Uh, so that way there's no surprises and you know to expect the, your turn. Um, so here's the, here's the a chief question. And I'd like your comments around that <clears throat> by flavoring kind of your experiences. So if you look at the first theme around judgment and discretion, should AI have judgment and discretion? Uh, let's invite uh, let's invite David's uh, thinking on that first. Yeah, well, I certainly I certainly can think of countless examples in my career where it was really important to to impart judgment and discretion to the AI. Uh, one example was when we were creating robots to go deep into caves and tunnels and bunkers. This work began with our efforts to map out like high radiation uh, and do decontamination, decommissioning in Department of Energy facilities, essentially energy facilities. And so the determining characteristic of these environments was that you couldn't use communication. So despite being a big fan of you know, developing the appropriate human robot interaction. In this case, you really couldn't uh, because there was no way to talk to the robot, right? It had to go into these um, tunnels and had to be able to work um, in, in environments where there was simply no way to either run a tether or to get radio waves to, um, you know, to send messages back and forth. And so many people argued that we needed to put strict limits on the ability of the robot to make decisions but then it just simply wouldn't work. I mean, like the problem was it needed to be able to make up its own mind deep in those recesses uh, of the ground and it had to be able to get itself unstuck. It had to be able to make decisions like, does it have enough battery power left to get back? Um, does it have the ability to, um, you know, figure out its way back to, uh, you know, the place where it had started? Um, otherwise it could just run forever and get lost and confused, right? So at the end of the day, we had to build that discretion into the vehicle. And the entire time, what the military was, you know, thinking about when we were using this in the military was um, predictability. And I made the point that actually if they want, you know, problem solving and ingenuity on the part of the vehicle, they needed to also put up with a bit of unpredictability because the two things are inextricably linked. And at the end of the day, there is no other way to you know, to modulate <clears throat> that, that trade-off besides discretion. Now, I would argue that the discretion that we provided was really human discretion imparted into the brain of the robot, right? Um, but I, I, you know, I don't think that that diminishes the discretion that the robot has. So in other words, if I impart judgment and discernment to my children, um, when they enact that discretion, it is their discretion, even though I help them develop it, right? So I think sometimes people want to make these very strange artificial separations where they say, well, it's all human judgment. The, the, the system has none. So, well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, insofar as the AI system is enacting that discretion, then it is indeed the AI system's discretion, regardless of where it came from originally, Right. So I'll, you know, kind of end my comments there, but, but thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for the brevity, uh, because I do want to hit the uh, diversity of the question and the themes over there. So perfect, uh, perfect uh, level of, um, of, of input over here. 
Um, so, uh, you know, I come from a deep and wide broad-based technology background. I introduced my IBM background and, you know, IBM synonymous with the history of computing. Um, before we turn to Jay, uh, here's a remark that I have in the context of this theme. Uh, computing moved from tabulation into true computing, and the cost of tabulation came down, the cost of computing came down. Um, and the way in context of prediction, which is what David was talking about, the way I look at it, AI is that the cost of prediction is going to come down. Now, that's very significant once we're able to bring, bring down the cost of prediction. So um, do we, or oh, turning over to Jay, so do we even have a choice, right? So we, mo we moved into learning algorithms as opposed to just logic, you know, hardcore logic, self-learning algorithms, and those applications come into cars and, you know, other interactions. Um, do we even have a choice in terms of where this discretion starts and where the discretion and judgment stops? when we are building AI machines. Jay, your comments and uh, color it with your experiences. Well, most of this stuff, you know, is kind of driven by the market, right? So to the extent that uh, that there is something, some utility, uh, I mean, we, people or businesses are going to do this stuff anyways, right? So uh, whether we use a judgment, discretion, whatever, you know, words we use. I mean, you know, I just like to actually step a little bit away and say that a lot of the underlying stuff here, you know, is this sort of, uh, imposition of some sort of consciousness on the part of, you know, these more complex AI machines. And that I think that comes from this notion, and there's a whole flat out theory out there about how uh, a, a some sort of a neural network that is sufficiently large and complex enough has this, this emergent property of consciousness, right? And I am, look, I'm all on board when Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking are cautioning about autonomous killer robots. I'm, I'm totally with them about that. But but this thing, I'm very skeptical about this whole notion of an emergent property of consciousness, because what actually I'm intrigued by is some of the work that Roger, Pe Roger Penrose, you know, has been doing about how uh, what, like he's been asking the question of what if consciousness is actually a subatomic phenomena based on certain research around human nerve cells. You know, they've been able to demonstrate that um, that there is some sort of fascinating quantum coherence that is occurring, you know, within human nerve cells where it, you know, just doesn't randomly occur in nature. And, and somehow by controlling that, they've been able to demonstrate, uh, you know, something related to um, anesthesia in operating rooms and the, the consciousness or the lack thereof. So, I mean, that really, if, if, if consciousness is really a, a subatomic phenomena, and then, then we're all kind of barking up the wrong tree, like with this question, because really what it means is that you want to research that idea uh, of consciousness as a quantum phenomena and try to really understand that. What does it, what does this really mean? Uh, you know, and then, and is it that then in that, in that case, you know, all of these ideas are kind of, uh, you know, what, what we're doing with all these machines so far, it just seems very basic and mechanistic in, in, in comparison with that. And so that's, you know, that's where my, my mind goes on this kind of question. Thank you, Jay. Um, before we turn our attention to, um, Janaid, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to be a little agile, as I know all of you are, um, and take a little nonlinear approach to the three themes. So again, for the benefit of the audience, the three themes we are on is judgment and discretion. The second one is oversight and policy. And the third is India takeaways. Um, I'm going to start weaving in the second theme into the discussion over here, um, uh, partly also in interest of time over here. Um, so... When we are talking about judgment and discretion, we have to hand in hand talk about oversight and policy. Who's accountable, right? So as we turn our attention to Janaid in just a moment, the way I look at it is when you invent a ship, you invent the shipwreck, right? So when you're inventing AI, you're inventing some AI wreck over there. How are we accommodating for that wreck and Jeanette all actually would be especially suited because the application and the frameworks for accountability in battle and weaponry would be very different for the framework of accountability in you know just common people like you and me so um Jeanette, over to you to reflect a little bit on the on the same theme as we as we go along here on the oversight and responsibility um yeah when ai has judgment and discretion <clears throat> So there, there's uh, three things I'd, I'd want people to think about 
uh, starting with the word P, which is, <laughs> we'll start with people, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, David's example of using AI to manage a robot so it doesn't get lost and knows to come back is actually a great one. That's actually a great application because the span of control is the robot. When you talk about a robot controlling all the lights in the city and moving the cars, now we have the uh, risk that if the robot makes a, in his case, if the robot makes a, makes a mistake, the worst thing is it runs out of battery <laughs> in a pipe. Uh, a, a system that is controlling a million cars has the potential to get confused and actually kill people. So one of the things I think we have to be sensitive to is uh, the uh, as we scale these systems, are they robust enough? And I would say we're a long way from that. The other thing you touched on is policy. Uh, a lot of the AI systems today are connected to sensor systems and they're vacuuming all the data, all the data. I mean, this is what I do every day in terms of zero trust security and compliance uh, here in the United States, right? And I think here, AI can take a good turn or a bad turn and India can help shape it. Unfortunately, a lot of the AI systems at the urban level are really set up for mass surveillance. Uh, this is, you know, I would say not what we want as a society, uh, but this doesn't have to be the future. I think, you know, you can integrate privacy uh, into the AI system. And this is where I think the Indian AI community, which is growing bigger and bigger by the day, has a great potential to shape technology to serve humanity, uh, not enslave it. And, and I know that sounds like lofty words, but I think it's kind of real. For example, when we design an AI system, we can design it to either hold the identity of a person or redact the identity before it comes into the data lake. So that, you know, and, and I'm actually working on this right now for uh, the state of Indiana, where, you know, working with the, the Economic Development Board, we basically redacted all the images of the drivers and the license plates uh, because we figured out we don't actually need them to figure out the uh, turning the lights on and off the intersections to the city. Right. And that's a that's a conscious uh, design decision. And I would say with respect to India, as India moves into the AI world, it has a way to shape the technology in a very powerful way. So, yeah, uh, a lot of opportunity for India to do something okay. spectacular. Excellent. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, you know, before I turn our attention to uh, to Will uh, from Together, I do want to uh, I do want to address the audience, and you know, thank you so much for for joining uh, again. I do want to encourage. It gets very boring, guys, if I don't hear questions. So uh, I don't mean to put anybody on the spot, but I do want to recognize it's not a very large audience, but I do want to recognize the names of the companies that I do spot on the audience. And Praveen is coming from uh, Londinium Asset Management. I uh, couldn't tell where he's based. Uh, Vishal uh, Agarwal is coming from Tata Steel. He is the Chief Corporate uh, Planning Officer. And then uh, Raghav, is, uh, Raghav Kanoria is coming from Switzerland. He's the partner of uh, Anchor Group. So, you know, we, we aren't the only experts in the room here. So you guys have a lot of expertise and sometimes the expertise is in asking the right question that we aren't thinking about. I am very big on crowdsourcing content for any event that I participate in. So once again, um, I would encourage you all to, you know, just jump in. So coming back to the floor over here, <clears throat> um, uh, Will, you know, when I say, like, when you in, when you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck, um, your work is quite the opposite. You are using AI to help the homeless. But is there a risk in mass surveillance of a disadvantaged demographic of society in the process of doing that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when you think of that collective t intelligence, you do, do have to understand that it is also collective risk. Um, dealing with the homelessness, yeah, that, that was an issue that started even in 2018 for me. Um, it was who has insight, what does the backside look to our solution because we are giving phones away to the homeless, you know, that have uh, specific information tailored to them. Uh, they are connected uh, via smart cities. You know, Minneapolis is nice that we have that. Um, not all cities do, but it's coming. Um, it, that was the biggest issue with uh, both lo local and federal governments and nonprofits is that trust. You know, uh, who is, you know, who's touching this data? You know, who can see behind the scenes 
What does that look like? Um, and, you know, a, a, the example that actually inspired me to do it in the first place was, you know, I was looking, I was at the homeless community that had built up in 2018. Um, and they came to me and they're like, you know, you know, we had a person that OD'd. Um, they tried to reach out to somebody. And by the time first responders got there, you know, they had already had passed by at least a half an hour. And they were like, you know, if, if somebody could have known exactly where they were, I mean, these tents are everywhere. You know, it's very confusing. Even if you know, okay, it might be in this area, it doesn't pinpoint it enough to be able to, you know, say, okay, it's that tent. And, uh, you know, that is that is still an issue that we have to, today, um, especially in dealing with, with homelessness on a broader scale. I mean, if you lose your home for any reason, I mean, technically you're homeless, Um Homelessness is connected to our in America to our social security number um, through what is known as the homeless management information system. They basically flip a switch when you're homeless, and that's how we're able to uh, to interact. But uh, you know, there are a lot of questions as far as oversights and things of that nature. Um, and the problems that we ran into is especially from from AI is that it is kind of impersonal. It's closed. Some people say opaque. Um, but even collective intelligence, I mean, who is this crowd? You know, how big is it? You know, are there any internal or external, you know, uh, influence that would change their decision making on the choices that they ultimately go with? And it, it's a problem. Uh, we need to pull both of them together. Uh, and through my consultancy, just to keep this short and wrap it together, uh, one of my clients, uh, his name is Aditya City. And uh, he is the founder of Fontaine. He's a native of Hyderabad. Uh, and he's actually actively bringing these two together, but adding a layer of empathy, um, which is needed um, as a strategically embedded technology partner. That involvement from an architecture level really does trickle down uh, to the end user experience. Um, I'd like to quote him. He said, at scale, Indians in IT need to understand and be very conscious of what they build. So bridging development teams directly to the user is very important. Um, so uh, they have created uh, greater empathy uh, through their development teams to understand the user they're building for and really appreciating that their biases will trickle down or may trickle down to the UX. And you know that, that, that has been an issue. And so we're hoping through some type of maybe open, open governance uh, you know, we can pull the two together and it will be, uh, you know, for the better. I'll throw back. Well, thank you, Will, uh, for those comments. And as we turn our attention over to Ed, and by then everybody would have had a chance to speak in this round. And then just to keep the flow and the themes managed over here, we'll circle around back to David. Um, by then we'll be sort of in the last uh, leg of this run. And we'll talk about India's specific kind of takeaways, a little bit of what, uh, you know, we'll already started to prime. So, Ed, my question to you is, uh, when I look at, um, when I look at um, uh, AI as on a spectrum of inertness of machines on the one end of the spectrum and the other is, you know, intelligence of human beings, where is the maturity of AI today? And then can you share your your thoughts around who should be in control? Right. So, so, so let's, take a, let's take a minute on that and then we'll circle into the last theme. Thank you. So the level of maturity, it's, it's around um, the, the human beings, around analytics and use of the data. For example, ESG data. So investors are looking at ESG data sets to identify investment opportunities. Uh, that's the most mature area as far as human involvement in those uh, those to do the analysis of the data sets. Uh, where the industry is really moving is making those machines more intelligent to help them assist humans in making the right decisions, whether that's in a smart city with an autonomous vehicle or whether that's uh, an algorithm making a decision on where do we deploy um, broadband internet connectivity. And so, when it comes to a human um, in AI collaboration, that's the biggest uh, impact that we can have as it relates to judgment um, 
specifically around identifying economic impact and economic opportunity. So just a quick example, uh, we all know that access to the Internet has raised a number of number of people out of poverty or given them better opportunities from an employment standpoint, any, anywhere from better employment to creating the next millionaire or even billionaires. Right? So imagine if AI had made the decision that only this person or that person that lives in a rich part of the world or a rich country has internet access, right? So now that excludes people that are uh, in poverty that doesn't give them an opportunity to be participants in the digital economy and help them again become either entrepreneurs or um, get more gainful employment to help themselves and their families um, raise themselves out of poverty. Great. Um, well, thank you so much, Ed. I uh, let's do a good, let's do a very very useful segue. Raghav, thank you so much for the question. And um, Junaid is already sharing some comments. I I might just give the microphone to Janad. Um, Raghav is asking that um, in the AI in the context of capacity to outgrow would be the most critical in defense. And Janad, I was going to come to you regardless of response on the gallery over there because I know of your defense background. Um, and even David has some. Um, how does how does one create regulation for this? Uh, as for other industries, and how can you standardize? Junaid, why don't you take a quick shot at this? And then, sure. David, why don't you take a quick shot? Mm -hmm. And then what I'll do is I'll start wrapping up with India takeaways from the other three panelists. So uh, I, I would say uh, there's a lot of opportunity to shape policy on the national security side, but also on the, the smart city side. Uh, two quick examples. One of the big issues uh, in the Department of Defense is it's very tempting to link machine-based image recognition to weapons control systems because now the system basically fires instantly. The problem with that is you can also <laughs> kill the wrong person instantly. <laughs> and, you know, there's, there's people like myself who are making a hard push within the national security community that AI image recognition should not ever be connected to the weapons control system by law, by congressional law, right? And that's an example where we as humans can really shape AI in a deep way. Jumping to the uh, uh, public side, we see that same parallel on the public side. I, I mentioned privacy, uh, but the other issue is the, you know, should AI control systems where humans live in? And the answer is no. And this is an example where we on the policy side can really shape how AI is used and I and the, the point to the panel and the audience, we should we shouldn't passively sit and just watch this technology just get deployed uh, in, in uh, throughout life. Uh, back, back to you, Jonay, Thank you so much for focusing that. Let me quickly turn to David, and then I'll go to Jay, um, uh, uh, Ed, and Will in that order to wrap up. Um, David, since you also come from a you know battle weaponry kind of a background, um, you reflect a little bit on uh, Raghav's question. Yeah, well, I've always made the point that long before we think about using AI to kill people, we should use AI to save lives. And there's tremendous opportunity in the exact places where I was focusing energy, like landmine detection, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, being able to detect IEDs and deal with them, <clears throat> you know, there's there's no reason to be putting bombs in the ground when we have over 100 million landmines that need to be um, found, right? So there are, you know, kind of human discretion issues uh, <clears throat> where I would advocate for doing um, good with AI, you know, before before we focus on weapons. The biggest challenge I have with trying to use AI for weaponry is actually perception. So in other words, people always want to talk about this question and abstraction and talk about things like the trolley problem because they want to talk about philosophical issues, which are interesting. But at the end of the day, we have a big pragmatic problem with the use of AI in weaponry, which is that the perception stinks. In other words, allowing um, AI systems to make decisions isn't so much about their you know, judgment at a high level. It's about the fact that they can't... Um, 
you know, perceive the environment and the situation well enough in many cases to make good decisions. So, so I want to make that point because it's, you know, there's a lot of engineering challenges associated with, with this as well. Um, the other point I would make is that um, across the board, long before we have to worry about robots sort of rising up and taking over control, uh, we have really the quite depressing fact that we've given AI systems control and that that control is really control over the most important things in our lives. What books we read, you know, who we date um, and and quite frankly, even when we turn left and right uh, while driving a car. Right. And over and over again, people try to make the point that we have a choice. Um, and that's true. You do have a choice. Right. We're not chained up in dungeons anymore. The manipulation and control that's exerted uh, is is done with our permission. Um, that's the real problem, right? And it's a problem that has to do with um, how we're targeted, right, by by AI systems, um, largely in servers. Uh, many of them in Mountain View, some of them in in Sunny, you know, Sunnyvale, but but really everywhere, including in India, right? And and so those servers, whether they reside in India or Silicon Valley, um, that's the problem that we really have in front of us. Thank you, David. And of course, unless it's an unprotected uh, left turn in U.S. or an unprotected right turn in uh, in India, which are open research areas for autonomous driving. Um, we are tight on time, guys. So um, who has the most compelling takeaway points in the India context? And I'll take two of you to please share your comments. Um, I could take all three, but you'll have to be very, very quick. So let's okay. take that risk, right? So, Jay, why don't you why don't you go really quick with your India takeaway and then we'll go to um, we'll go to Ed and uh, finish up with Will. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm kind of optimistic. Uh, Govinder, we've talked, you know, in our previous session about, about the question of ethics, you know, in, in, in democratic societies, AI uh, applications and so on, India versus China. We talked briefly about stuff like that. I mean, the good news is that, uh, that um, uh, you know, I've been paying attention as a crypto investor. I've been paying attention to what, ha- what the Supreme Court in India did with the RBI, you know, and basically overturned their thinking. And uh, that, that makes me optimistic. I mean, ultimately, this question of AI and ethics really is, I think it, sh- it, it transcends even politics. It, it's, it's a legal question. And, and the good news is that, you know, we're showing that the, the Supreme Court in India is alive and kicking. All right, Jay, give me your main point and then I've got to move. So that's it. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just expressing optimism, you know, for perfect. The- I, I love the optimism, uh, especially when we are wrapping up. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt, and I will interrupt uh, you guys. So, um, <laughs> Will, uh, Will, why don't you go next? Because Ed has something very compelling, and then he'll wrap up. Fine. Yeah. Of course. Thank you. Um, uh, just in wrapping up, uh, you know, with collective intelligence, um, you know, it's very limited, but I think it's needed to humanize AI. Uh, to kind of give the human touch to that first point of data as it goes into the system. Um, and to be able to find, you know, because it's a lot of noise and it's about finding those signals, um, or I call it the melody. Um, and people like Sir- Aditya and Fontaine, they're really doing it. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ed, you got to wrap up the panel. Your headline, please. Yes, and I was looking at the Arrow City in India as a a model of public-private partnerships and how corporates can come together with government as well as economic developers in order to uh, make uh, private sector investments in infrastructure, specifically around AI infrastructure and traditional infrastructure. So that's a model that the world can follow. Well, thank you so much for the question from the audience. You really kept us uh, engaged, uh, at least not bored. Uh, and uh, by all means, uh, continue the conversation offline by being in touch with any of these panelists. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you so much, David, um, Ed, Will, Jay. It really was a pleasure to be with the distinguished crowd over here. My name is Gurvinder Aluwalia. We're signing off. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.